Welcome back. In this fourth lecture, we will cover manometry and surface tension. Manometry is connected with measuring the pressures. The one of the simplest manometer is a U2 manometer. In this case, in the picture shown, we have a bulb A which contains a gas and then a liquid column shown in red in a tube. The difference in the level in the two limbs is H. The pressure at A can be measured by using the principle that the fluids have the same pressure at same horizontal level if the fluids are connected. So, in this case point 1 and point 2 will have the same pressure. Since the density of the gas is very small, we can say P A is like P 3 and P 3 is P 1 minus rho G H because from P 1 we are going up a distance H. So, it is minus rho G H and P 1 is equal to P 2 is equal to atmosphere. Putting it all together, P A is equal to P atmosphere minus rho G H. The pressure of the gas inside the bulb is lower than the atmospheric pressure by an amount rho G H, where rho is the density of the manometric fluid in the tubes. Consider two bulbs A and B. The bulbs A and B are filled with a liquid of density rho 2. These bulbs are connected with an inverted U tube. The black fluid has a density rho 1. The difference in the level of the fluids is H as shown. Clearly, we can calculate the pressure difference P A minus P B through a process similar to what we did last time. We seek points on the horizontal level connected by the same fluid. Points 1 and 2 are two points at the same level connected by the same fluid. So, the pressure at 1 must be equal to pressure at 2. We will exploit this fact to calculate the pressure difference P A minus P B. We go up or down from points 1 and 2 till the next interface. In this case, P A is clearly P 1 plus rho 2 G H 2. Since the uncolored portion of the tube is filled with a fluid of density rho 2. So, pressure at 1 is higher than pressure at 1 by a liquid column of height h and of density rho 2. Similarly, P 3 which is below P 2 is equal to P 2 plus rho 1 plus g h where h is the height of column 3 to 2 and rho 1 is the density of the fluid there. Similarly, P B is equal to P 3 minus rho 2 G H since B is higher than 0.3. So, the pressure is lower. Putting it all together that is summing these three equations, we get P A minus P B is equal to rho 2 G H 1 minus H minus rho 1 G H. If we know the heights h and h 1 and the densities rho 1 and rho 2, we can calculate the pressure difference P A and P B. We do another example, a little more complicated manometer. Here we have a bulb with a pressure P of a gas. And the manometer is three fluids 
of density rho 1, rho 2 and rho 3 as shown. We use the standard method of calculation that we seek points at the same level connected by the same fluid and equate the pressures in two different limbs and then we move up and down within a fluid to the next interface. Let us mark the points 1, 2, 3, 4. These are the levels at which the fluid changes. Clearly, P2, the pressure at point 2 is greater than pressure at point 1 in the rightmost limb and is given by P2 is equal to P1 plus rho 1 g h 1. In the second limb from the right, the pressure at the level 2 is the same as P2 and so pressure in this middle limb at a level of point 3 would be same as pressure at 3 and the pressure at 3 is lower than pressure at 2 by amount minus rho 2 g h 2. So, P 3 can be written as P 2 minus rho 2 g h 2. Now, point 3 is above point 4. So, pressure at point 4 is P 3 plus rho 3 g h 3. Putting all it all together, we get P 4 is equal to P 1 plus rho 1 g h 1 plus rho 2 g h 2 plus rho 3 g h 3. Since P 1 is the atmospheric pressure, so the gauge pressure at point 4, P 4 gauge is given simply by rho 1 g h 1 minus rho 2 g h 2 plus rho 3 g h 3. In all these applications, typically we will have to make two measurements of levels and then the pressure related to difference between two levels. Sometimes we use with a much larger cross section area and the resulting reservoir manometer is as shown. There is a fluid in a very large cross section area reservoir to which a pressure P is applied. Because of this pressure P, the fluid contained within the reservoir rises up a thin capillary. Since the diameter of the capillary is very small, as the fluid level changes in the tube, the level within the reservoir does not vary significantly and we can assume this is at a constant level. So, that by just measuring the height of the column on the scale provided, we can find out the pressure P. This is used in a conventional blood pressure measuring equipment. Here at the bottom, there is a large reservoir, a relatively large reservoir of mercury, which is connected to a very fine bored tube against a scale. It is kept vertical and when the pressure is applied to the reservoir, mercury rises as a column within the capillary and by reading the height of the mercury column on the scale, fixed scale provided, we can calculate the pressure head. This is a reservoir manometer 
with many tubes, a multi tube manometer. Here, it is being used to measure the pressure distribution about an aerofoil. The sketch shows an aerofoil with a large number of holes. From each hole, a tube runs to one of these tubes, many tubes. There is a reservoir too, which contains the fluid. And so, the height of these columns give an indication of the relative levels of pressure at the different holes in the aerofoil. This is another device, an inclined tube manometer. See the pressure difference that we measure is rho g h. If h is small, it can lead to error. So, to increase the value of h, we incline the limb of the manometer at an angle theta. The pressure at this point, which should be equal to the pressure at this point, is higher than the pressure at this point by the amount rho g h, but h is L sin theta. So, the pressure P is rho g L sin theta. This is a commercially available inclined tube manometer in which the two pressures are connected at this nozzle and in this nozzle and it measures the difference along the scale shown. This another inclined tube manometer in which the inclination is variable. The errors in very low measurement of mercury, very low measurement of liquid heights is very large compared to errors in the larger height. So, we need more inclination when the height of the column is less, but we can do with lesser inclination when the height of column is more. So, in this commercially available variable inclination manometer, the tube is curved in such a manner that the inclination at low values of head difference are large, but the inclination at higher values is low. In fact, the tube becomes vertical towards the higher end. Bowden gauge is a gauge that is used to measure the pressure most commonly. It uses the property that if the if a curved tube of an oval section is pressurized, it tends to acquire a circular section and in the process it straightens out. This we show here we have shown a curved tube with an oval section shown here. As we apply a pressure P at this end, the cross section of the tube tends to round out as shown here and as the section of the tube changes, the curvature of the tube decreases, its radius increases, so it expands out and it expands out the pointer attached at the end moves on a scale and this gives a reading of the pressure. This is the basic principle of a Bowden gauge, one of the most commonly used pressure measuring equipment. The other types of gauges use bellows and capsules. In this first picture, there is one pressure which is applied on the outside of the bellows, 
The other pressure that we want to measure is transmitted inside the bellows and depending upon the pressure, the bellows move in and out. And as the bellows move, they push the pointer around a scale. More the pressure, more is the reading on the scale. Similarly, we have a metal cap capsule here or a diaphragm in the form of a capsule. There is a case pressure, the atmospheric pressure in most cases, which is applied here and then we, the pressure that we want to measure is applied there. Because of this difference in pressure, the capsule inflates or deflates resulting in a motion that is converted into the motion of a pointer in a, on a scale. Tire gauge, based on the Borden tube principle, reads the tire pressure as a gauge pressure, about 34 pounds per square inch, PSI, or 234 kilopascals. Gauge pressure is the increment of pressure above atmospheric pressure. This is another instrument based on the same principle, but designed to read absolute pressure. It reads about 14.4 psi when open to the atmosphere at the altitude where these experiments were done. If we apply pressure above one atmosphere, the reading increases above 14.4 psi. As a vacuum pump draws the pressure down, the reading tends towards zero on this absolute pressure scale. Both these instruments operate on the Borden tube principle. The curved tube is connected to the high pressure being read. A higher pressure tends to straighten out the tube and vice versa. The end of the tube is connected to a linkage that drives an indicating needle on the face of the pressure gauge. There are other instruments to measure pressure, such as this diaphragm-type transducer. A pressure difference across the thin metal diaphragm causes it to flex and changes the internal capacitance of the transducer, which is sensed electrically and converted to a pressure reading. This is a modern piezoelectric pressure transducer. Its tip contains a crystal that responds to pressure changes by generating an electric charge. The amount of charge can be converted to a pressure reading through calibration. Another common type of pressure pickup is a capacitance type pressure pickup. In this case, we utilize the fact that as the distance between two charge surfaces changes, the capacitance changes. And so that results in electrical signal that measures the difference in pressure that is applied here and the pressure that is applied on this side. On one side is the atmospheric pressure usually, on the other side is the pressure that needs to be measured. We next cover a phenomena called surface tension which is quite prominent in fluids at rest. Fluids at rest who have an interface with other fluid, most often with the gas. You might have seen little insects which seem to be walking on water. Here is an insect known as a water strider which is walking on the surface of water without sinking. How is that achieved? Similarly, in this picture, we have a cup of water on the surface of which a paper clip is floating. What is supporting the weight? of this paper clip. Clearly, 
it is not buoyancy because the pin or the paper clip not submerged in water. So, what is going on? The explanation of these two phenomena lies in what is called surface tension. At the interface between a liquid and a gas, the upper surface is under tension. A molecule which is not at the surface is being pulled on each side by molecules of the liquid all around it, but a molecule on the surface is pulled down and because it is pulled down and it cannot go down, there is a tension created on that surface. If we apply a force vertically on the surface, the surface bends, produces a small dip, so that the end of the surface at the end of the dip, the surface is inclined and the vertical component of this inclination balances the vertical force which is shown by a red arrow. This is what is happening to the clip. You can see the water around this clip is showing a depression. So, it is like a membrane which is stretched and supports the weight of the clip. Similarly, you notice in details that each leg of the water strider, there is a cup like formation of the water surface. The surface is curved and the tension on the surface is now providing an upward force to each leg. The surface tension in liquid can be measured by a small setup. We have a U-shaped frame on which we have a slider. If we create a film of liquid on this, that film of liquid can support a small force F. This small force F depends upon the length L of the film in the horizontal direction as shown and this force F is equal to sigma L where C, where sigma is termed as the coefficient of surface tension for the liquid gas pair. It depends upon the liquid and the gas both. For water in contact with the air the value of sigma, the surface tension is 7.56 into 10 raised to power minus 2 Newton per meter. It is a very small quantity, but can become significant in many cases, the two of which we have already discussed. The force of surface tension is also responsible for formation of bubbles when a droplet of water is in contact with the surface. In fact, here it is the three surface interface, the solid, air and liquid that are in picture. As the addition increases to the right, the cohesion decreases to the right and the wetting increases. We say that at this location the wetting is minimum and at that location the wetting is maximum. 
you would have seen that if I have waxed paper, a droplet of water onto that wax paper would almost look like this on the left. But on an ordinary paper, the droplet of water would spread out like this because the water wets an ordinary paper, but it does not wet a waxed paper. On a wax paper, the adhesion with the paper is low, cohesion within the water molecules is high. We introduce a term contact angle. Contact angle is the angle that the droplet makes with the surface. So, here the contact angle is large, here the contact angle is small. These are surfaces in wetted surfaces, the contact angle is low. On glass, water has a very low contact angle, almost zero. Water wets the glass almost completely. But if there was mercury, the mercury does not wet glass and the mercury would be sitting on a glass with almost spherical bubbles. So that the contact angle alpha is 180 degrees. This wetting results in liquid meniscus as shown. On the left is a fluid like mercury which does not wet the tube material and so we have a convex meniscus. On the right is a liquid that wets the wall of the tube. So, we have a concave meniscus. Water in a glass tube forms a concave meniscus, mercury in a glass tube forms a convex meniscus. The meniscus of mercury in a glass would be much more pronounced than that and it would be, the contact angle would be almost would be 180 degrees there and the contact angle if it is water then the contact angle here would be 0 degree. So, meniscus would be much sharper. We next calculate the excess pressure inside a bubble like a soap bubble. Let us form a soap bubble of radius r. The pressure inside is a little more than pressure outside. How do we relate the pressure difference to surface tension? Consider half the bubble below the equator. The free body diagram of this bubble shows the forces in this bubble. There are two kinds of forces. This set of forces are the forces that act on the surface of the bubble and they are because of surface tension of the liquid surface and the air. This all allowed the circumference of the cut that we have created. And these forces are the pressure forces that act on the hemispherical surface because of the pressure, excess pressure inside. If the excess pressure is P, then we can show by simple calculations that this pressure force, the component in the vertical downward direction is P times 
pi r square where pi r square is the area of the diametrical plane of this bubble. In the surface tension force upwards are uh, sigma times the length of the equatorial cut which is 2 pi r where r is the radius of the bubble. But that is only on one side. A bubble would have two sides of the surface. One the outside in contact with the outside air and one inside in contact with the outside air. So, total surface tension force would be sigma times 2 times 2 pi r. And so, the equation would be the P internal gauge pressure that is above the outside pressure into pi r square, the area of the equatorial plane is equal to 2 pi r sigma, which is the force on one side of the hoop into 2 because there are two sides to the hoop. So, the internal pressures is 4 sigma by r. It is interesting. This pressure or the excess pressure where is inversely like r. That means, lower the radius we need more pressure. So, while blowing a soap bubble, we need a larger pressure to start the bubble and then the pressure needs to decrease. We need more air in there to increase the diameter, increase the size of the bubble, but the pressure inside must be lower. There is an estimate of this internal pressures. We are talking for water with a sigma of 4, 2.5 to 10 to minus 2 Newton per meter and the radius at 1 millimeter that is 0 0.001 meter and this gives you 100 Pascal. 100 Pascal is a very small excess pressure.
in this video that we showed, when the two bubbles coalesce together and we stretch them by keeping taking our hands apart, the bubble surface acquired this shape. This is because surface tension results in stored energy in the film and the surface acquires a shape with the minimum energy and that minimum energy occurs when the surface area is the minimum. So, this surface is the minimum surface that is formed with the amount of air that we had in those two bubbles. Similarly, we showed that when the experimenter played with a bubble with gloved hands wearing the woolen gloves, the bubble were very spherical and they were jumping from hand to hand. This is because the wool is not wetted by the soapy water that the bubbles are made of. In the context of surface tension, let us do an example where we calculate the maximum diameter of an aluminum ball that can float on water. There is a small aluminum ball which is floating in water. We have to find out the maximum diameter that this ball can have. If the diameter increases, the ball would sink. That is, the surface tension force would not be enough to keep the ball afloat. It should stand to reason if we argue that is at the maximum size of the ball, when the weight of the ball would be maximum, the surface tension force would be maximum and the maximum surface tension force would occur when the ball is immersed to up to its equator. That is half the ball is inside and half the ball is, in, is outside in air. So, that the length of the water air interface at the location of the ball is maximum equal to pi times the diameter of the ball. Now, we draw a free body diagram of the ball. It has three forces. One is the weight of the ball m g, other is the buoyancy force on the ball. The buoyancy you studied in high school is related to the volume of the liquid displaced or rather to the weight of the liquid displaced. Here the volume of the liquid displaced is equal to half the volume of the sphere 2 by 3 pi r cubed and so the buoyancy force would be rho of water times g times 2 by 3 pi r cubed. The weight would be rho of aluminum times g times 4 by 3 pi r cube. And the third force is the surface tension force, which acts over a length pi d. So, that the force is sigma pi d. If we put all the forces together, we get the weight should be equal to the buoyancy force upward plus the surface tension force upward. Unlike in the case of bubble, there is only one interface here. So, the length we have taken is pi d and plugging in the value for various quantities, we get d is equal to 6.4 into 10 to minus 3 meters or 6.4 millimeter not a very small diameter. So, aluminum spheres of diameter 
can float on water if they are carefully launched. Another consequence of surface tension is the capillary action. Here you see there was a droplet of water on a surface on a table top and if a paper towel is brought in contact with this, the water is soaked up by the paper towel. What pulls up this water? It is the force of surface tension. In this picture, it is shown a container where there is a blue fluid and a number of tubes with varying bore. The leftmost tube has the largest bore and the bore size decreases as you move to the right. So, this tube has the smallest bore and you see the water, the liquid, the blue liquid rises up in this tube beyond the level contained in this tube. The liquid is not maintaining its level. The liquid is rising up and rising up more in tubes with a smaller bore. Tubes with their very small bores are called capillaries and so the phenomena is termed as capillary rise or capillarity. Another example of capillarity is that what water, the colored water from the higher or from the cup with a higher level of water is flowing into this over the edge through a rag. To analyze this capillary rise, consider a capillary in which the water or the liquid has risen up to a level H. Of course, we ignore the meniscus and measure only height in the main tube. We consider the free body of this fluid. This free body is shown here. Clearly, the pressure at this point is the same as pressure at this point, same level in a liquid connected with, with the same fluid and the pressure here is atmospheric. So, pressure there is atmospheric. So, in this the pressure on the top is atmospheric, pressure on the bottom is atmospheric and we have not shown it. Other forces, the weight of this column of liquid which would be the density times the volume of the liquid which is pi r square the cross section times the height h times g and this is balanced by the surface tension force sigma into 2 pi r assuming that the contact angle is 0. So, this force is vertically upward. Water in a glass tube would have sigma is equal to the contact angle to 0. So, this force would be sigma into 2 pi r. Clearly at equilibrium the two forces must balance and therefore, we can get a capillary rise h is equal to twice sigma divided by pi r g. The larger the value of r, the less is the capillary rise. Let us estimate this capillary rise for a for water in a capillary of diameter 1 millimeter that is of radius 0 0.5 millimeter and if you plug in the value, the value of h 
the Kepler rise at 29 millimeter, almost 30 millimeter, almost 3 centimeters in a tube with a bore of 1 millimeter. An interesting phenomena. All the trees and vegetation on earth need water for their growth. The water is sucked up through the roots, through a system called xylem. and it goes up. The product of synthesis travel down through a system called phloem shown here with yellow arrows flowing down. Now, the tallest trees on earth over 100 meter tall the redwoods of California, USA, over 100 meters tall. We need a pressure differential of about 12 atmosphere or 1.2 megapascal to raise water to the topmost leaves. There are many ways by which this kind of pressure difference is created, not the least of which is the capillarity the capillarity of the sap wood of redwood trees, which is in this region around the tree trunks. It is a foam like wood, fibrous wood with a mean diameter xylem at about 50 micrometers. Of course, the phloem are just behind the bark of the tree, just inside the bark of the tree and they produce a flow downwards. In fact, it is argued that this flow of fluid of the product of photosynthesis downwards also help in raising the water up because it creates a kind of vacuum up there when the water flows down. But you remember that even the absolute vacuum produces only about 10 meters of water rise in a barometric tube. So, this is only a very small portion. It is a complicated phenomena and we cannot explain it fully here just to give an indication of that the capillarity is part of the answer. That brings us to the end of this lecture. In the next lecture, we will do forces on submerged surfaces. Thank you.